Good morning, everybody. Woo! Just by a show of hands, how many people in here are alive? <laughs> Some of you weren't sure? <laughs> That'd be a problem. It is a good thing to be alive, and it's amazing how much we just take that for granted. I love talking about life. Um, we all have our different stories, and it's amazing because we hear about the word of our testimony being so important. We don't realize how much that can stir someone, someone's heart, someone's soul. It can help birth that ministry that she was talking about. My wife and I actually started our ministry, the Radiance Foundation, a few years ago. You can see my wife was a teacher for 13 years. I was a creative director working in the ad agency world for the same amount of time. And we wanted to tackle the easiest subjects possible. Abortion, racism, fatherlessness, poverty, you know, all the easy stuff. And so we, we started back in 2009. This is actually our 10-year birthday or 10-year anniversary of the Radiance Foundation. But we started it back when, if you remember, 2009 when the economy was booming. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, because it wasn't booming back in 2009. People thought we were crazy. How are you going to leave your full-time job and start a nonprofit, something you know nothing about? And so we started this full-time job because it's amazing. When God calls you to do something, he's going to equip and enable you to do it. Amen? And people might think you're crazy. And quite honestly, I don't know, if you're a Christian, you have to be a little crazy anyway. Because we don't do things the way that the world does things. We don't see things the way that the world sees things. And so we started the Radiance Foundation to do three things. To illuminate, educate, and motivate. To illuminate the simple truth that every human life has purpose. To educate people about a myriad of social issues on the context of God-given purpose. And then that last part, motivate. How many of you get at self-motivation by a show of hands here? It's kind of depressing. Well, <laughs> maybe you're better at motivating other people. But see, what good is this knowledge? What good is truth? What good is our faith if we don't put it into action? And so we started this. I am officially the chief creative officer of the Radiance Foundation. That's me at the age of two. Come on. There you go. <laughs> um, I know what happened. Anyway, how many of you parents out there have strong-willed children? Well, if they're here, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but how many have strong-willed children? And sometimes you try to figure out, what am I going to do with this child? What am I going to do with this stuff? Because you feel like sometimes, right, that it can, that's going to kill you. Well, I was that strong-willed child for my parents, and I just want to speak a word of encouragement to parents out there right now. Just wait about 25 to 30 years, and that strong-willed stuff will turn into something really constructive. Still on the apology tour with my parents. But we love what we do. In fact, I love that God enables triumph to rise from tragedy all the time, that he uses someone with a story like mine to prove so many lies wrong. I'm a creative I love creating stuff, everything you see on the screen here, everything at our table back in the lobby there, the Radiance Foundation's table, everything at Radiance.life I've created, but it's not to celebrate me, but it's to highlight a God who does the impossible all the time. And so what we are committed to at the Radiance Foundation is this. Our society says we face a lot of phobias. You could probably rattle off a few of those phobias that we supposedly face, but this is actually real. Factophobia, it's infected our schools, our, our mainstream media, it's infected our churches, unwilling to talk about the facts, the truth. And so you can see the tagline here, it says, truth ain't hate, let love illuminate. Say it with me, truth ain't hate, truth ain't hate. let love illuminate. We're constantly called haters when we're speaking from a biblical perspective. Anybody know that feeling? People just try to shut you down, call you a hater, and they think they end the conversation. Nope. Don't let it end the conversation because we have to love people enough to not only speak the truth but live the truth. And we're motivated by 1 Corinthians 13, 6. It says, love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. So this is why we do what we do. We create a lot of original content. A lot of the stuff at the table is free. There are tons of postcards, whether they're back there at the table on our website. We've been able to get in all kinds of venues. I mean, when God calls you and you're like, wait a minute, but we don't have the money. Wait a minute, we don't have the connections. Wait a minute. God's not a wait a minute kind of God. <laughs> He's like, I got this. Can you just be faithful and obedient and just do? And so he has opened up so many venues. We've spoken in colleges across the country and all kinds of conferences, Harvard, Princeton, uh, University of Notre Dame, Columbia Law School. I mean, doors have opened to teach congressmen and congresswomen on Capitol Hill, holding sessions and summits there leading rallies at the Supreme Court, things that we never could have imagined 
ten and a half years ago that we would be doing. And it's an amazing thing just to serve God and to say, God, I'm willing and I'm able, which my wife always says, those are some dangerous words. <laughs> because God will, will take you at that. And I love that we're able to address these tough issues. And of course, since I'm talking about the issue of abortion today, I just want to make it clear that the Radiance Foundation is always, always compassionate toward the individual, particularly those who are post-abortive. And there are some great resources, national resources, you can see there, Radiance dot life slash heal. There are also pregnancy centers in this area. I know there's Pregnancy Center East, Pregnancy Center West. They offer post-abortive uh, counseling. God's a God of wholeness and healing. He's not one who wants you to live in regret and shame. That's not of God. And so we just want to put that out there. We are always <sighs> relentless about exposing an industry, but always loving toward the individual. Because we believe this. It's our Twitter handle and and just like the uh, countercultural mom over there, we are also, we've been, we've been kicked off of Twitter. We're, ban we're shadow banned right now. It's ridiculous. Social media has, has an issue. Um, free speech and truth are not their thing. Um, but this is our Twitter handle. But it's actually our worldview. More importantly, it's our worldview. We believe that whether you're planned or unplanned, whether you're able or differently abled, whether you're red, yellow, black, brown, or white, every human life has purpose. Amen. <laughs> Yes. Say it loud. This is what we believe in. In fact, I'm going to just kind of break down the word life. So there'll be four main points that if you don't remember anything else I say, get these four points. And so we're going to break down life into an acronym. And the first one is love one another. And this comes from 1 John 4, 7 through 8. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love, does not know God, because God is love. Now, we hear from the culture a lot of different definitions of love. In fact, you know, love is love. No, no, no. God is love. The only definition. And so when I think of loving one another, I can't help but think of my family. And two parents who had no idea what they were getting into, having 13 kids. Just think about that for a moment, 13 teenagers. They had no idea what they're getting into, but they knew that they were called to love in an imperfect world, but in a journey where they realize that God, the God of the impossible, loves us so perfectly. Life is never picture perfect. Human beings come in all different shapes, sizes, colors, and abilities. No matter how much we plan, no matter how much we think we're prepared, the unplanned happens all the time. It's how we respond to the unexpected that shows our true humanity. But many do not see the value of every human life. Too many are willing to discard those who don't fit the picture of perfection. Abortion destroys the chance to love and to be loved. We never know what will fill the frames of our lives or how empty those frames can be when we allow exceptions. Every life is a gift. See, my family, my family is full of exceptions, full of those who be so easily written off because they didn't fit that picture of perfection. My family originally started like this. There were five, and people probably looked at that and said, hey, picture perfect. You have three kids, you're good. But it's amazing how God has a different plan for us most of the time. This picture, I mean, these are my three original siblings. Um, I don't know what you're going to call them, the homemade ones. <laughs> they're, they're the first ones. And so that's how the family started. And people will often ask, well, what, what inspired your parents to adopt? What influenced your parents to adopt? And sometimes you kind of hear the subtext, and it's more like, what possessed your parents to adopt 10 children? Love and brokenness. See, adoption in the natural and the supernatural happens because the, the natural order of things is, is broken. And it brings healing and restoration and wholeness. And with my mom, actually, that's where the, the dream of adoption, the heart for adoption started. It started at age five. My mom grew up in, with an alcoholic father. He was... Not a kind man. He was emotionally and psychologically abusive. 
And so her parents were separating, and at the age of five, this little girl, it, it's amazing how, how much we underestimate the way that a little child receives things and how they perceive the world. But at the age of five, my mom was placed in a children's home for a year. And during that time, she just remembers, even though she was visited separately by her parents, there was another little girl with physical disabilities. No one ever came to see her. No one. And that broke the heart of a five-year-old. And so she just remembers getting down on her knees one night and just praying, God, help me be a mommy to those who don't have one. That heart for adoption was shared by the most amazing man that I know, my father, a man who loves Jesus, a man who is just a man of integrity. He was the same man at home as he was outside of the home, always, always. It's really hard for me now because he's struggling and slowly dying from Parkinson's. It's a horrible thing to, to watch. But my dad's life exemplified Christ to me. My mom's life exemplified Christ to me. And so that heart for adoption shared, because if you're going to adopt 10 kids, you have to be on the same wavelength, I'm just saying. So the first one uh, was me. This is actually the first moment my mom was able to hold me. I was six weeks old, came with the largest passy ring you've ever seen. <laughs> but this moment, like so many moments in our lives, came at a cost. See, I'm a firm believer that adoption unleashes purpose. Again, in the natural and the supernatural. But self-sacrifice unleashes purpose. In fact, my mom, who would always try to have a connection with her father all her life, she knew that his brokenness could only be healed by, by Jesus. And so she tried all her life just to bring him to Christ. So he had been involved with the original Bombergers that you saw there earlier. For years, you know, he was in and out, but he was at least involved in their lives. He said, if you bring that I'll keep it rated PG. <laughs> if you bring that black child into your home, you're going to ruin your family. And so with all the flaws and the brokenness my mom knew of her father, she didn't know he was also a racist. So the moment my parents adopted me, he had nothing to do with our family the rest of our lives. So my mother literally had to lose a father in order to gain a son. I will say she chose well, she chose me. <laughs> Just saying, he missed out on 13 awesome grandchildren. <laughs> Never saw us the rest of our lives. So here's where our family is still kind of small. We were just a family of eight. And I love this article. So my parents didn't do many interviews at all, but the journalists actually got it. They understood the journey of adoption in our family. You can see by the title, it says, Unwanted Children Find Their Wanted. And we were loved like crazy. And this is why I, I hear sometimes Christians say, well, adoption was never God's plan. Are you kidding me? Have you cracked open the Bible? Ephesians 1.5, there's so many examples. But Ephesians 1.5 says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. I mean, when you read the genealogy of Christ in the book of Matthew, you get through all those names that you cannot pronounce. And then, does it end with Mary? No, it ends with Joseph who was not biologically related to Jesus. See, Joseph had a situation, you're talking about a humanly unplanned parenthood, right? Humanly, obviously divinely planned. But you're talking about a courageous teen mother. You're talking about a father who could have chosen to leave, but he chose to love instead. He could have chosen abandonment, but he chose adoption instead. So yes, we have great examples of adoption throughout scripture. And so here, th these are all my siblings. All 13 Bomberger kids, Everybody's got an afro. Even white people got afros in the pictures. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> we obviously don't look alike, though. We're white and we're black. We're white and black. Native American, Vietnamese. Two of my brothers are albino, so that brings legal blindness. So there, there are numerous physical disabilities, some learning disabilities. But everybody in this picture has special needs. Just like everybody in this room, in this sanctuary right now, has special needs. That's to love and to be loved. And I will say, we were loved like crazy. I don't know if you see that little dot, but that's me right there. Favorite in the family, just saying. <laughs> Anybody know that feeling? But see, you see this picture of diversity. I know we hear the word diversity all the time. Diversity, diversity, diversity. And God created diversity. I love it. He wants us to enjoy it. But there are some things that we share in common that are even more powerful. And like those things, to love and to be loved. But one of the most powerful things I, I learned growing up is my parents did not emphasize colorblindness. 
I know people mean well when they say we should be colorblind. No, we shouldn't. God created color for us to celebrate, not to separate ourselves by it. But the one thing I learned is this, and this is one of the foundational tenets of the, the Radiance Foundation, is we are one human race. Can I get an amen in here? We are one human race. We're so fixated with the, the pigmentation of our skin. It's all beautiful. Every hue is beautiful. We are all, by the way, people of color. Unless you're transparent, you are a person of color. Just putting that out there. But I want to show you a picture of what unwanted looks like. Because when you hear in the conversations about abortion, well, a child shouldn't be unwanted. A child shouldn't be unwanted. A child shouldn't have to grow up in poverty. A ch- people should not have to face difficulty in their lives. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Who in here has never faced a difficulty in your life. So when you hear that phrase, unwanted child, I want this image that I'm about to show you replace whatever you might have in your mind. This is what unwanted looks like. It's just my siblings, their spouses, their children. There are no aunts and uncles or cousins, not extended family. There's a little grandma in the middle picture, but it's just our immediate family. So this is what unwanted looks like. That's 64 strong, people. And the crazy thing is this picture is about three years old, so there are about 14 more people added to this photo, to this family picture through adoption, through marriage. But see, this is what happens when you defy the world's low expectations. This is what happens when you love. Our parents had no idea what they're getting into. By the way, you do not have to adopt 10 children to not know what you're getting into. You can have one child who is biologically related to you, and you wonder whose child that is. I mean, you just don't know what you're getting into. There is no manual. I don't care how many books there are out there about parenting. There is no magic formula. It's a lot of prayer. Can I get an amen from parents out there? Yes. (laughs) But see, this picture happens, is possible, I should say, because of courageous birth moms. This picture wouldn't even exist without 10 courageous birth moms. I never met my birth mom. Years ago, I, I sought her out just to thank her. I wrote a song called Meant to Be, and I just wanted to send a copy of the song to her, that's all. I've never met her, there was no response, so at this point, I figure I do so many events a year that maybe one of these events she'll show up. <laughs> I don't know how many of you ever ugly cried in your life, but it would be a moment of ugly crying for me. I just, I want to thank her. So as a creative over the years, in addition to the song meant to be and other efforts, I've tried to try to express gratitude. Like to me, words seem insufficient. What do you even say to someone who went through nine months of a traumatic pregnancy? So as a creative, I try to figure out, well, I want to show the things that I've been able to become in my life by the grace of God and only by the grace of God, all because of her singular decision. We often don't think about the power of one decision, what we do today, how it affects next week, how it affects next month, how it affects the next 10 years. My birth mom's singular decision will have reverberations for generations. And so this is the tribute that I created. I wrote the song, sang the song to this, just to thank her. And maybe, maybe through social media, maybe she will see this somehow. If I don't ever get to see her face to face, this is kind of the conversation that I would have with her.
truth never gets old. Never gets old. I am the 1% that's used 100% of the time to justify abortion. But yet Psalm 139 talks about how you knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. There's not an asterisk there that says, oh, wait, if you were humanly planned. God enables triumph to rise from tragedy all the time. That takes me to the second part of the acronym for life, the I. Identify the lie. One of my favorite verses is Ephesians 4.14, especially in a culture today that wants to redefine words and redefine gender and redefine hate and love and the very essence of God. I love this this verse because our foundation doesn't ever change. Truth is immutable. It does not change. Ephesians 4.14 says this, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will, will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. So clever, they sound like the truth. Wow, that's our culture today. Where it's a lot of emotion and very little evidence. When I think of how adoption unleashes purpose, I think of the lie on the other side of that, the antithesis and the abortion industry that crushes purpose thousands of times a day, about 2,500 times a day in the United States. Now, Planned Parenthood that touts itself as a pro-choice organization, it's amazing what we do with euphemisms, by the way, pro-choice, demonize the option of adoption. So if you're pro-choice, are you really pro-choice if you're demonizing one of the only two alternatives to the violence of abortion? This is from their website. For years, they've had this on their website. It was part of their tool for educators. And so they say the psychological responses to abortion are far less serious than those experienced by women bringing their unwanted pregnancy to term and relinquishing the child for adoption. Explains why they abort almost 120 lives for every one adoption referral. They don't make money on adoption. They only make it on abortion. But to understand this broken mentality, you have to understand the DNA of Planned Parenthood, the DNA of the abortion industry. Margaret Sanger, wish we had a lot of time to get into this, but I can only touch on this lightly. She's the founder of Planned Parenthood, the mother of Planned Parenthood. People will often say, oh, well, you took that quote out of context, or you took that quote out of context. You can read the entirety of her writing. She was a brilliant woman, duplicitous, broken, Like my mom, she grew up in poverty, she grew up with an alcoholic father, but it's amazing the different paths we can take. You can choose to break free from your brokenness, or like Margaret Sanger, stay in that vein of brokenness. You can see from from this image here, she, she wrote a book called Motherhood and Bondage. She didn't have a positive view about motherhood. The birth control review was her periodical. It was some of the most racist, elitist, Nazi sympathizing content that that you'd ever read and her book, Pivot of Civilization. I mean, here's a woman who chose to remain broken and her way of eliminating poverty was not to eliminate the cause of it, it was to eliminate the impoverished. She went in a lot of people sterilized. She had different groups. She had um, those who were physically disabled, those who were incarcerated, those who had children outside of wedlock, outside of marriage. I mean, she, she had this whole category, category called feeble-minded too. So lots of people apparently fit in that feeble-minded category that they should not reproduce. They should actually be forcibly sterilized. I mean, this is the founder of Planned Parenthood. The thing that's interesting when you think of feeble-minded, I mean, okay, I'm just going to throw this out there. Most, is it, most of Congress today is kind of feeble-minded, so it's a dangerous thing to saying, I'm not going to get too political. I'm Sorry, that really was not kind of me. But when you think of, what does that even mean? What is feeble-minded? But Margaret Sanger understood that you could put all kinds of people in that category and that it didn't matter because if you could write off someone's humanity, it was easier to justify the violence against them. Here's Margaret Sanger answering the question in 1957 about what sin is. Now, keep in mind, people will say, well, that was all last century. She was so old. Her mindset was old. Eugenics, that was the the belief to be well-born. That was an old mindset. But she lived during the same time of Martin Luther King Jr. She died a year after him. But we don't write off his worldview as archaic and old. But I want you to hear her words. She's asked, do you believe in sin? And this is Margaret Sanger's response. Do you believe in sin? 
when I say believe, I don't mean believe in committing sin. Do you believe there is such a thing as, a, as sin? Well, I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being, practically. Delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just mark when they're born. That, to me, is the greatest sin. Who was marked when they were born? <laughs> I mean, to think that someone could be the, the arbiter of human value because they knew that you were marked when you were born. You know when we were marked? We were marked when we were created. Actually, Jeremiah 1.5 talks about how he knew us before <laughs> we were formed in the womb. Before. Yeah, we're marked with something. <laughs> we're marked with purpose, God-given purpose, every one of us. It's a shame. Planned Parenthood, this is, this is around the time Margaret Sanger, 1938, this is one of their brochures. So in the midst of all their lies, occasionally they would actually tell the truth. And if you see this, this is one of their brochures uh, called Plan Your Family. And you can see one of the questions is, isn't it an abortion? Talking about birth control. And their answer, abortion kills life after it has begun. Well, they knew that in 1938. They don't know that in 2019. It's amazing what happens when your business model changes. So they move from birth control to abortion on demand throughout the entire pregnancy for any reason. Which is why you get tweets like this from Planned Parenthood. If you're a black woman in America, it's statistically safer to have an abortion than to carry a pregnancy to term or to give birth. This is called junk science, is not statistically safer. But see, they get away with this. Just now change the context. Imagine if President Trump tweeted that. Mm hmm, different reaction, right? But see, Planned Parenthood tweets this, and nothing. But if President Trump, Trump, had, Trump, Trump had tweeted that, I mean, what kind of response? What kind of things would you hear in, in mainstream media? Racism, white supremacy. But Planned Parenthood gets away with it. In fact, there was an op-ed that the new president of Planned Parenthood, Alexis McGill Johnson, she wrote this op-ed for Wall Street Journal, defending Margaret Sanger and saying that she wasn't a eugenicist, even though she was a member of the Eugenic Society, that she wanted the two organizations to merge, but whatever. I mean, truth is not, I mean, they're going to abort human lives, over 330,000 each year. They're going to abort the truth every single day. But she's defending Margaret Sanger, and then she's saying, oh, wait, the abortion industry, we're not the racist ones. I mean, sure, abortion rates in the black community are five times higher. Sure, we send out tweets like that saying, if you're a black mother, you're better off aborting your child than to go through pregnancy. But we're not the racists. Oh, wait, no, no, the pro-life movement, they're the racists. How does that work? The ones who are trying to save human lives, regardless of hue of skin, are the racists, but the ones who are disproportionately killing black lives are not? This is the kind of stuff when you have to identify the lie. Another lie that you know, Planned Parenthood gets half a billion uh, taxpayer dollars a year, and they call themselves the nation's largest sex educator. They forgot three letters. Miss Educator. This is on their teen Tumblr page, and they're being asked by teens, supposedly, is it wrong to be promiscuous? And so this is Planned Parenthood's response. Keep in mind, half a billion dollars every year. Since the number of sexual partners you've had doesn't say anything about your character, your morals, or your personality, <laughs> or about anything at all, really, there's nothing bad or unhealthy about having a big number of sexual partners. This is Planned Parenthood, the nation's leading sex educator. This is why we have some great resources back at our table, these fact sheets, lots of free stuff. These fact sheets, it's break down the top 10 reasons, for instance, to keep Planned Parenthood out of your local school. Of course, there are more than 10 reasons. There are hundreds and hundreds of reasons. And number one should actually be enough. But in, in reason seven, it's very interesting because Planned Parenthood spends millions fighting every parental consent, parental notification bill. And this is what they say. This is from their website. These bills, quote, put teens at risk of abuse at the hands of their parents. You know, because a Planned Parenthood activist knows what's better for the child than parents. But see, they're always trying to, set, I mean, they're, they're grooming customers. Anybody who understands Marketing 101, the, you have to understand, Planned Parenthood is in, involved in many high schools across the country. In fact, they work with the CDC in developing curriculum, health curriculum, they just groom customers. And what kind of customer do you want? Do you want one who's going to come one time and then you'll never see them again? Or do you want the revolving door kind of customer? It's what they do. 
and they promote this fake feminism. So I, I love that our children are involved in our ministry through the Radiance Foundation. And so my 10-year-old, Aaliyah, um, and we talk about fake feminism. We talk what it means to actually be empowered, to understand true equality. Abortion does not make you equal. Inherent value makes you equal because we're all created in the image of God. We all have equal and irrevocable worth. So sometimes you have to poke fun at the ridiculousness of, of some of the propaganda out there. So we decided we're going to put together this little jingle and just highlight fake feminism. They love to tell ya, abortion's all good for ya. Just pay your fee and get equality. Their fraud's extensive, their lies defenseless. Their paradox's been coming for a century. It's fake feminism. It's fake feminism. It's fake feminism. They don't want you to know. This is basic health care. Thousands of women die before Roe every year. We're not political. Planned Parenthood, we're not partisan. Planned Parenthood, yes! Fake feminism, yes. Fake feminism, yes. Fake feminism, they don't want you to know. Yes. Fake feminism, yes. Fake feminism, yes. Fake feminism, all they want is your doubt. Hopefully that jingle sticks with you the rest of the day. But this is... We have to be able to identify the lie. This is why I just want to end with this. We've heard this kind of earlier today. There is no such thing as your truth or my truth. There is just the truth. And so we just try to break this down. People will talk about, well, Planned Parenthood, only, only 3% of their services is, is abortion. Look at all the other services they provide. This is what defenders of Planned Parenthood always say. Well, mainstream media does the same thing. The only problem is they never actually look at the other services that Planned Parenthood provides. Because if they did, they would see that Nearly every major medical service to women has been plummeting for over 10 years. This fact sheet is also available at our table. Breast cancer screenings, they don't own a single mammogram machine, so these are manual breast exams. Breast cancer screenings are down 65%, pap tests down 72%. Prenatal care, even though 86% of women become mothers by the age of 44, 0.1% of Planned Parenthood services is prenatal care. Are they really the women's leading healthcare organization that they call themselves? It is all lies. And that's why I love this. The, just a huge difference. The abortion industry lures women with their lies. Pregnancy help centers love women with their lives. I don't know if there's anybody in here who works for a pregnancy center. I mentioned two that are here locally. I really encourage you. There are ways you can look at pregnancycenters.org to find the one that's in your area. There are 2,700 of them. They take care of mother baby, born and unborn, and they do mentoring programs for fathers. All their services are free, and they make not a single cent on the people who come through their doors, and they value every life that comes through their doors. Here's another thing people don't realize that you will never see inside of a Planned Parenthood or any other abortion facility. It's a baby boutique. Sometimes they call them a mama baby boutique. Free maternity wear, free um, baby clothes, furniture, Diapers, formula, the list goes on and on. Hundreds of thousands of items that pregnancy centers give out for free as they do their parenting classes. So usually it's called an earn while you learn program. See, there's a difference. For an abortion facility, the woman is, is a transaction. In pregnancy center, they look at the woman and the, the mother and the father as people worthy of transformation that loving them enough to see them through their journey. And it doesn't end when the child is born. In fact, many of these pregnancy centers work with them for two years after the child is born. We have to be able to, to identify the lie, and we have to be able to fight the lie. And that's the third one. Ephesians 6, 10, 11. I love this. People forget that we're in a battle. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Why do you need armor if it's not a battle? So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We are in a battle. And so many people are deciding just to kind of be spectators. That's why when I think of my four children, I have four kiddos, two of whom are adopted. Love them like crazy. Love them all like crazy. 
Unplanned means nothing to me. I mean, three of our four were unplanned. What does that mean? And most parents out there, you, you understand that you could plan all you want. <laughs> Things don't quite happen that way. Am I right? Yeah. All the time. That's why I want to give you a great resource because, see, the world is exposing our children at the youngest of ages to all kinds of things from a broken perspective. We have to teach them from a young age. We have to teach them, like my wife says, we have to teach them before the world reaches them. And one of the resources that we've just created just came out this week is called Pro-Life Kids. It's an adorably illustrated book that teaches about human dignity, about equality, human value, and to help encourage young children to be a voice for the, for the unborn. Proverbs 31, 8 through 9, be a voice for the voiceless. See, children are naturally pro-life. That's the natural position. You actually have to be taught that it's okay to harm the life of an innocent human being. You have to be taught that. Why aren't we breaking through and teaching them so that we don't get into situations like this? Here's a, a clip. It's so, uh, it's kind of insane, but we're, we're dealing with a world that's so broken. Um, I'm a firm believer, I'm, I call myself a factivist. See the difference between activism and factivism. Activism is solely emotional. Factivism, we, we recognize the emotional, but we also fuse that with the evidential, with the evidence. But here's a clip of what happens when you don't have that worldview pressed on your heart from a young age. When a woman gets pregnant, that is not a human being inside of her. We know it's a living human being that's inside of her. I mean, I'm used to people arguing the personhood aspect. Well, that, that human being is not a person yet. Well, let's just get rid of that. Every human being is a person. Every person is a human being. What has happened throughout history when one group of people gets to say, you're not a person? Does it ever end well? Never. And we're looking at 60 million plus destroyed because of Roe v. Wade. I want to give you an example right here in this state. This billboard appeared in Cleveland, there were 16 billboards that, that, your, that Ohio's largest abortion facility called Preterm placed 16 billboards throughout Cleveland, uh, 11 of those billboards, 12 of those billboards were put in predominantly black neighborhoods. Abortion is necessary, abortion is a family value, abortion is sacred. So we work with a coalition of, of pregnancy centers, of right to life groups. We actually worked with the chairwoman of the NAACP in Cleveland who doesn't agree with us on some of their issues, um, but absolutely agree with us on this. We also work with uh, Al Sharpton, <laughs> his national network, his activists in that area. Then they were actually on our side, which does not typically happen. Miracles happen every day. And so we placed our own billboard campaign to respond immediately to this. And so we placed 12 billboards in that area like this. Abortion is systemic racism. Abortion is lost fatherhood. Abortion is fake feminism. Abortion is regret. Abortion is exploitation. And here's this coalition of black and white, left and right. It was an amazing thing. It's amazing the things you can actually find agreement on sometimes. But you won't know unless you start standing up for what is right. I mean, when we started the Ratings Foundation a few years ago, we decided we we're going to take the two easiest topics possible. We're going to race and abortion and combine them in a campaign that had never been done before. We're the first ones to deal, to deliver a public ad campaign dealing with the hugely disproportionate impact of abortion in the black community. And don't get me wrong, abortion is tragic, equally tragic, no matter the hue of your skin. But no one had ever done a campaign in the community that is hardest hit, statistically, where rates are five times higher. In New York City, the home of Planned Parenthood, more black babies for decades have been aborted than born alive. So we placed billboards in Atlanta, then we moved to other major cities. In fact, this, is in, this was placed in the conservative San Francisco Bay Area. Not so conservative. 
60 billboards we placed there, and we were denounced by Planned Parenthood, of course. We were denounced by the ACLU, which felt really good. Um, we were denounced by the NAACP. The NAACP that called this campaign horribly racist, and it gave the false impression that Planned Parenthood kills black babies. What? Planned Parenthood kills black babies, white babies, and every hue in between. In fact, according to their last annual report, 332,757 precious lives made in the image of God. And so being the factivist that I am and not being the quiet person at all, I wrote an article about the NAACP that I grew up revering and loving. I used to love the organization. So many landmark achievements like Brown v. Board of Education that they fought for. So I wrote about them. I criticized their, their alliances with Planned Parenthood. In fact, at the time that I wrote this, their president, uh, the president of, of NAACP, Benjamin Jealous at that time, was doing a $1,000 a ticket fundraiser for Planned Parenthood, yet the NAACP said they hadn't taken a stand on abortion. Yes, you have. If you're raising money for the nation's largest abortion chain, you have. So I wrote an article, and this is what I titled it, NAACP, the National Association for the Abortion of Colored People. They did not like it <laughs> at all. And they sued me and they sued the Radiance Foundation. And it was insane. Two years in federal court, we were actually represented by Alliance Defending Freedom. Now, sometimes you may think, I don't have the connections, I don't have the money. We, well, Bethany and I didn't either. We didn't know what we were getting into. But we knew that there was something wrong and we had to speak to it that precious lives, black lives matter in and out of the womb. Amen? Amen? All of us matter. Why? Because we are made in the image of God. We have value not given to us by man or woman or governmental institution, but from a much higher power. And so here we are, just fledgling little 501c3 organization, and Planned Parenthood is so threatened by us that they literally produced a, I'm going to call it a crocumentary, documentary, crocumentary, talking about how great they are and how much they do for the black community to respond to one of our billboard campaigns. Let me just play you a short clip from that. Millions of Americans have stories. So we got on a bus, brought a camera, and let people speak for themselves. We listened to patients, to healthcare providers, to those who have been on the front lines, and those worried about the next generation. I said, well, you know, this is a really tough decision. And there were some tears, you know. Um, but I actually left the procedure going, okay, you know, this is, this is the best decision for me. Three kids is, is a good number for me. It, you know, I only have so much lap space. I only have so much arm space. I only have so much time in the day. Uh, and they're all over the country. And you may know that there are forces out there that uh, have been trying to destroy uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, we saw one of those forces not too long ago, and you know that I was involved when they put some billboards right over here off of I-75 that said black children and endangered species. Uh, but we are not a species. We are God's children created in God's image. It's Planned Parenthood. It helps me to be a better pastor. Did you catch that last line? I'm sorry, call me crazy. I thought the Bible made you a better pastor, not Planned Parenthood. He is actually a board member of Planned Parenthood. <laughs> it's insane. We have to identify the lie. We have to fight the lie. And most importantly, we have to expect the victory. It may seem impossible, and no matter what the issue may be, it, it may seem insurmountable. But yet we serve a God of the impossible all the time. Romans 8.37 says, no, in all these things we are what? More than conquerors. We're overcomers. We're not undercomers. We're overcomers. And not on our own strength, but through him who loved us. Philippians 4.13, reinforcing that again. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, the abortion industry is constantly telling women especially, you can't overcome. You can't face the unplanned. Are you kidding me? How many strong women are in this sanctuary right now? Come on, let me hear you. How many strong men are in the sanctuary? <laughs> we lowered the octave. 
I don't even have a bassy voice, so I'm not going to pretend. But the reality is we can overcome all the time. We have to expect the victory. Now, I talked to you about the NAACP insane lawsuit. Two years in federal court, we were facing bankruptcy. They were suing us for over $700,000. We didn't even have 1% of that. <laughs> but they picked on the wrong two people. My wife's from New York City. Her family's from New York City. I'm from a family of 15, and when you have 13 kids you're, and you're almost a middle child, um, they're not going to silence us. So we, we knew that we had to step out and, tr and try to be courageous. Two years in federal court, we lost on the first level. First federal judge ruled against us. He was a lifetime member of the NAACP. His sister-in-law was a former president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Didn't have to recuse himself. So we lost on that level. But we appealed to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia. And we won. So... And it led me to actually write this book called Not Equal, Civil Rights Gone Wrong. So many civil, great civil rights organizations who have veered so far off the path. And I'm inspired by someone whose hair that I want to have one day. <laughs> Thank you, Freddie. Frederick Douglass, former slave and abolitionist, women's rights activist. Um, I should call him a factivist. <laughs> someone who was written off simply because of the hue of his skin. But yet he helped to reshape the, the conscience of President Lincoln. At that time, when he was alive, pr the greatest orator of his time, if you haven't read his speeches, please just Google Frederick Douglass' speeches. Phenomenal man who loved Jesus, and that just flows through, through all of his speeches. So powerful. But at that time, mainstream media was fake news too, and it refused to tell the truth about slavery. So what did he do? Oh, well, I guess that's it. I can't do anything. Mainstream media is not telling the truth. Well, then go out and tell the truth. So he started his own newspaper called The North Star in Rochester, New York. And he said the reason that he started this is, I see before me a life of toil and trials. Hello, the life of a Christian. But justice must be done. The truth must be told. I cannot be silent. People, we don't have the luxury of being silent. There are so many culture-shifting issues that are happening right now that are getting to the very core of who we are as people. That there is brokenness that's being affirmed, and we as Christians who have the truth, I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to be unfriended on Facebook. There are worse things than being unfriended. We love people enough to speak the truth. Thank God Frederick Douglass didn't just stop because it seemed insurmountable. I also want to throw this in there, too. Frederick Douglass was also conceived in rape. The people we write off. See, the circumstances of our conception don't change the condition of our worth. Did anybody in here control the, circ your, the circumstances of your conception at all? By a show of hands, anybody? Because <laughs> that would be really weird. <laughs> I just thank my birth mom for choosing to be stronger than her circumstances. And I talk about the beautiful reverberations that can last for generations. These are the most beautiful reverberations in my life. They call us the bombs, the bomb burgers, the bombs. But, um, man, she never could have known what God had in store. And so happily married to the love of my life, my, my wife, Bethany, who's the co-founder and executive director of the Radiance Foundation. And from left to right, our youngest son, Justice, who was adopted, my oldest, Ray Ray, who I've adopted, and our two middle kids who are competing for middle child status, Makai and Aaliyah. And you heard Aaliyah sing a little bit earlier, but I'm just so blown away every day because I'm reminded of my birth mom's courage. I'm reminded that we can all play a role in human triumph, but we cannot do it if we're afraid of the word of God. We cannot do it if we're afraid that someone's not going to like us or someone's going to threaten us or someone's going to sue us. It's going to happen. But the best part about it is that you can play a role in helping to set somebody free. And so I, I love that God has given me this incredible gift of family. And, and the, the spot that I made that showed all the things that I've been able to become in my life by the grace of God. So I'm playing that music in our little studio. And, and Aaliyah, who at that time wouldn't sing publicly, 
in front of anybody. She would just sing at home. The moment, you know, when you ask your child to do something in front of other people, and, and you're like, yeah, show them, show them, and they make you look like a fool. I always love that. Yeah, Aaliyah had that down to a science. But she came in and she heard it. She said, oh, I love that song. Can I sing to it, Dad? I'm like, yes, yes, sing to it. So she was actually nine years old at that time. And so she said, well, what should I sing? I said, baby girl, just sing whatever comes to mind. So she just comes up with her own harmonies. I just hit record. And so while she's singing, I'm not going to lie, I'm a sappy dad, and so I'm just crying because I'm reminded that she's here because someone chose to be stronger than their circumstances. Life has purpose. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine through me. Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world. So go out there and illuminate injustice, speak truth because you love people enough to help set them free. Amen. Courage does not need a crowd, people. It just needs conviction. God bless.